Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I think we'll just get started. I think there should be more people still to join, but they can join in the next couple of minutes. Um, for those of you who don't, don't know me, my name is Laura. I'm a solicitor in our Glasgow team, and I'm joined today by my colleague Lee, who's an associate in our Glasgow office as well, who'll be speaking to us a bit later. Um, can I, I think a lot of you have joined muted. Can I please ask you to keep yourself muted unless you're speaking just to minimize the background noise? Um, if you do have any questions, please, if you're feeling confident, please feel free to shout out. Otherwise, you can use the chat box um, and we'll try to deal with as many questions as possible. Um, if you have any specific advice that you're looking for, we can't give that out on the call, but we're happy to follow up with you afterwards. If you want to speak to Lee or I or your usual Burness Paul contact, then we're happy to help with any questions you have post um, webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded, so if you have any questions about that, please just check out our privacy policy on the Burness Paul website. That's all my housekeeping done, so we'll just move on to the topic of the day. So you'll know from our invite that today we're looking at the gender pay gap. And the reason for this is that despite a number of employers being required to report their gender pay gap data yearly, the most recent published figures show that the progress to close the gap is slow. And it's clear that to see an improvement, employers need to be doing more. During the session, we're going to cover how the gender pay gap is reported and our top tips on how to reduce your organization's gender pay gap. Firstly, a quick explanation of what it is. So the gender pay gap is the average difference for men and women who are working. There are two ways the gender pay gap is calculated and this is why sometimes you can see conflicting stats about the gender, gender pay gap. The first is by the Office of National Statistics and that's calculated by reference to the annual survey of hours and earnings and the second is by mandatory reporting which some of you may have to do as part of your role but only certain employers are required to report their gender pay gap. So turning first to look at mandatory reporting as many of you know, under the Equality Act 2010, Gender Pay Gap Information Regulations 2017, a bit of a mouthful, public, private and voluntary sector organisations with 250 or more employees need to report annually on their gender pay gap. The, da the date sorry, on which this obligation will kick in, if applicable, is known as the snapshot date and is the 5th of April for private or voluntary sector organisations and the 31st of March for public bodies. If an organisation doesn't surpass the 250 employee thresholds on the relevant snapshot date, so either the 31st of March or the 5th of April, they're not obliged to report their gender pay gap that year. However, they can choose to do so if they wish. So following the most recent mandatory reporting, which happened just in April past, the 5th of April 23, the Guardian newspaper completed its own analysis of the figures and they published an article, I think many of you may have seen it, stating that four out of five companies and organisations in Great Britain still pay their male employees more than their female employees and that the median pay gap remains stubbornly wide at 9.4%, which is quite surprisingly, or perhaps not at all surprisingly to some, the same as it was in 2017 to 2018 when employers were first required to publish the information. The article then went on to confirm that the construction, finance and insurance activities and education sectors reported the biggest median pay gap, with women earning between 21 and 23% less than their male colleagues, according to the analysis of more than 9,000 companies that provided information about their industrial sectors. On the other side of the table, health and social work sectors and accommodation businesses registered the lowest pay gaps, with their median gender pay gap at 2%. Organisations that are required to report must report their gender pay gap at that snapshot point using six distinct measures and these measures each offer a different insight and they're as follows. I'm not going to give you a maths lesson on how to calculate them but I'll provide a helpful summary. So the first is the mean gender pay gap which for calculating the gap for hourly pay you would calculate as follows. So you would calculate the total pay for male employees, you would then divide this by the number of male employees you would do the same for female employees and then you would subtract the figure the female figure from the male figure you would then divide this figure by the average hourly pay for males and multiply by 100 and that will give you your mean average gender pay gap in hourly pay as a percentage of men's pay the next calculation you would run is the median gender pay gap so if we look at that again for hourly pay to create this calculation 
you would create a list of all men's salaries from lowest paid to highest paid. You would then identify the salary right in the middle. You would run the same exercise for women, so the highest, highest and lowest, and then the median again. And you would then subtract the women's median from the men's median figure. You would then turn that into percentage by dividing the result by the median hourly pay for men and multiply it by 100, and that will give you your percentage figure for the median gender pay gap. You then would do similar for bonuses, so you would have the mean bonus gap and the median bonus gap, bonus proportions and the quartile pay bands, where you would split it into the four quartiles, which is lower hourly, middle hourly, upper middle hourly and upper hourly um, pay quarters. The figures will then usually be either a positive or a negative percentage. So a positive percentage shows that women have lower pay or bonuses than men in your organization. A negative percentage shows that men have lower pay or bonuses than women in your organization. And a zero percentage shows that there is an equal pay or bonuses between men and women in your organization, depending on the calculation that you're running. In terms of preparing the calculations, as I said, I'm not going to give you a maths lesson on how to do that. Um, but the government website does have a helpful breakdown of how these can be calculated and the figures that should be included as part of this. Or if you have any questions while you're running that, please feel free to reach out and we can help you with this. Once calculated, an organisation must publish their data on the government's gender pay gap reporting service website and private and voluntary organisations must accompany this with a statement confirming its accuracy. While it's not compulsory, the government strongly recommend that reporting organisations also offer an explanation of any pay gaps and, if needed, a plan to reduce these. The information is then publicly available for others to re review. So if we move on from mandatory reporting and we move on now to the Office of National Statistics gender pay gap. The Office of National Statistics first started monitoring the pay received by men and women in 1997 and the data since then has shown that men on average, still earn more than women. The gender pay gap reported by the ONS is a long-term series calculated from the annual survey of hours and earnings, which samples from all employee jobs in all sizes of company. The annual survey of hours and gender pay gap analysis is different from the gender pay gap based on compulsory reporting, so the mandatory aspect that I just talked about. In April 2022, the gender pay gap amongst all employees, including part-time and full-time, was 14.9%, a decrease from 15.1% in 2021. Trade Union Congress analysis in 2023 showed that due to gen the gender pay gap, women work for free on average of 54 days per year. So this year in 2023, the Women's Pay Day, i.e. the day that women stopped working for free, was on the 23rd of February 2023 which is only two days less than the day which women worked for free in 2022. The Trade Union Congress analysis also examined variations in the length of time women work for free due to their age, the region they're based in and their industry. Older women wait longer than average for their women's pay day and women aged 60 and over will work on average of 67 days for free but the length of time is the longest for those between the age of 50 and 59, which was at 76 days. The age variations in the gender pay gap are, I'm sure not surprisingly, presumed to be due to parental status and caring responsibilities of women in women of that age. Regional variations are likely to be caused by different sector and industry that are most common in the different locations. The gender pay gap is higher in all English regions than in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And the analysis showing that the gender pay gap is largest in the southeast of England at 17.9%. The largest industry based gender gap was 31.2% and that was found in finance and insurance. Other trends that we've seen in 2021 that remained in 2022 include the gender pay gap is much higher for full time employees aged over 40 years. That was at 10.9% compared against those under the age of 40, which was at 3.2% and higher earners experience a much larger difference in hourly pay between the sexes than lower paid employers. I don't want to have to mention it, but COVID, um, the word is back. COVID of course played a part in the gender pay gap. And there's a concern that the COVID-19 pandemic could have in reality widened the gender pay gap as evidence suggests that during the pandemic, a greater burden of childcare fell on women. Women workers were also more likely to have taken part-time roles, reduced their hours or taken unpaid leave due to care and responsibilities. So the difference, there's a slight difference between gender pay gap and equal pay. So 
it's worth noting that they are different, where equal pay is also a requirement under the Equality Act 2010. Equal pay is concerned with men and women who perform equal work being paid the same, whereas the gender pay gap measures the difference between all men and women's earnings in a specific organisation. Gender pay gap analysis would thus reveal if within an organisation recruitment practices meant the bulk of low paid roles were undertaken by women, while the high paying roles were dominated by men. Equal pay analysis would potentially not reveal this gender distinction. So moving on to our top tips, and I know that's why you're all here today for these. So while the appropriate action to tackle and establish gender pay gap will differ across sectors and organisations, and what may work for one organisation may not work for another, we have the following top tips to encourage a reduction in your organisation's gender pay gap. So firstly, determine whether your organisation, determine where your organisation is in terms of their gender pay gap. Do you need to mandatory report or would you benefit, if you don't need to mandatory report, would you benefit from conducting a gender pay gap review internally? You can set targets for improvement and conduct a review as to how you reach that goal. Be proactive and consider our other tips and what you might be able to implement to make a difference. Secondly, use structured interviews for recruitment promotions. The reason behind this is to prevent any unfair bias creeping into the interview. As a structured interview means that all candidates are asked the same questions in a predetermined order and format. Following the interview, applicants' responses can then be graded with pre-specified standardised criteria, and this prevents the likelihood of any unfair bias affecting the decision of who to hire and who to promote. Thirdly, do not use employee salary history when configuring offers for new employees. The reason behind this is it stops a, an effective beck-in of a previous discriminatory pay practice for former employees into their new role. Pay gaps often begin at the start of a woman's career and then compound over the years when employers base the salary offered on a candidate's previous pay rather than the relevant salary for the role they are applying for. Similar, on a similar vein, our top tip four is disclose the pay range at the outset of the job advert. This ties into the current working world where more employees are calling for companies to be more open about the salary and job applications and where employees employees or applicants have more information about opportunities outside of their current positions, particularly about pay, they're more likely to apply for promotions or raises internally because they can see what they can get on the open market and what they should be receiving within their own organisation. Fifthly, sorry, I've just seen your comment. I'll run through the tips and then we'll come to the questions at the end if that's okay. Fifthly is utilise pay transparency. So when conversations around pay happen in secret, it can be easier for discrimination and bias to factor into compensation decisions. So pay transparency aims to help employees and employers avoid discrimination in discussing, disclosing or inquiring about compensation, which ultimately can eradicate the current wage gap based on gender. Of course, an employer has to be very confident that there's no equal pay or discriminatory pay practices in their organisation prior to implementing any pay transparency, which is usually achieved by having clear job grading or job structure and, and thoroughly conducting an equal pay audit. However, we should flag if you are considering conducting an equal pay audit, you should take legal advice to ensure that any audit prepared is subject to privilege and not disclosable to employees. Some of you may already be aware that some countries have a very open pay transparency system in place, such as Sweden, there is, and I'm going to apologise in advance because my pronunciation is awful, it's Tax or Scala Dernan, and that's in place, which is a public information site which holds the required tax income from work and capital for everyone in Sweden over the age of 18. So you can effectively look up what your colleagues or your neighbours get paid on that site. Six. Top tip six, offer and encourage flexible working to make roles more accessible to women who are more likely to be balanced in unpaid care and family commitments. And of course, to encourage men who wish to take on those responsibilities through flexible working as well. Both the House of Commons and the Women and Equalities Committee have acknowledged flexible working for all lies at the heart of addressing the gender pay gap. As a result, companies should seek to implement flexible working practices by having a flexible working policy and a means of employees to request flexible working. Number seven, offer clear, fair and transparent promotion criteria slash programs which will assist to ensure that these are accessible to all employees. 
It's also important to consider how these are implemented into practice. For example, ensuring that part-time employees are, are not being overlooked for promotion opportunities and are actively applying for being promoted or being put forward by their managers. If part-time employees are not actively applying for promotions or are being overlooked for promotions, then you should consider why that is and what can be done to counter this. Number eight, encourage men to use shared parental, other family-friendly leave, so unpaid care and family work is more evenly split. Doing so will allow women time off from parental responsibilities and the ability to return to work earlier from family leave, for example, using shared parental leave. Number nine, as with other forms of bias and discrimination in the workforce, raising awareness through training programs can also equip employees with the knowledge and tools to recognize and address sources of inequality. Unconscious bias can, could be contributing to the pay gap in recruitment and promotion practices. And if you're interested in hearing more about our employee training programs on topics like discrimination and recruitment practices and flexible working requests, please do get in touch. And finally, number 10, consider whether it would be worthwhile expanding your gender pay gap calculations by including other calculations. One example is framing calculations at different levels of the compensation structure to identify issues such as where the gender pay gap actually starts and when it becomes exaggerated. As I mentioned earlier, gender pay gap is larger for employ employees over the age of 40 years old, and often the level of pay in an organization merge the hierarchy of the business. So it may be beneficial to conduct additional pay gap calculations to cover different levels of seniority. So for example, in a law firm, you structure for solicitors and senior solicitors, associates and senior associates, directors, and then partners. By assessing gender pay gap by pay levels, this can provide a granular picture of what is happening at different levels of seniority and can show where a gender pay gap begins and how this increases across different levels of the business. Looking at this means you can identify where changes may need to be implemented. Many of our top tips may seem obvious, however, they can be easily implemented and will make a big difference in taking steps to reduce the gender pay gap in your organisation. And many of our top tips actually form part of the new EU pay transparency directive that you may have heard of. So on the 24th of April 2023, European Council adopted new rules on pay transparency through the EU pay transparency directive. The purpose of the directive is to combat pay discrimination and help close the gender pay gap in the EU. While the directive will of course not apply to the UK given we've left the EU, business with operations with operations across EU member states will need to consider these new requirements when they come into force in those jurisdictions. There could then be consequent pressure to adopt the same transparency practices across the business, including in non-EU member states for employees and expectant potential new recruits in a tight labour market. So it's helpful to be aware of the changes that it will bring. Among other things, the directive gives employees access to the information needed to determine whether they are being treated fairly compared to employees in the same company and gives employees the necessary tools to claim their right to equal pay. The directive also includes provisions on compensation for victims of pay discrimination and penalties, including fines for employers who break the rules. The Pay Transparency Directive will come into force upon publication in the EU's official journal. EU countries will then have up to three years to adapt their national legislation to take account of the new rules. Two years after the transposition deadline, the requirement to report gender pay information every three years will be extended to companies employing over 100 workers. Rather, initially, the reporting obligation would only, will only apply to companies with 150 or more employees. So how do the new EU rules intend to increase pay transparency and enforcement? Firstly, by access to information. So the rules will make it compulsory for employers to inform job seekers about the starting salary or pay range of advertised positions, whether in the vacancy notice or ahead of the interview. Employers will be prevented from asking candidates about their pay history. Workers will be entitled to ask their employers for information about average pay levels broken down by sex for categories of employees doing the same work or work of equal value and the criteria used to determine pay and career progression, which must be objective and gender neutral. There will be reporting obl obligations, so companies with more than 250 employees will be required to report annually on the gender pay gap in their organisation, which is what we already do in the UK. For smaller organisations, the reporting obligation will take place every three years. Organisations with less than 100 employees won't have any reporting obligations. 
If the report reveals a pay gap of more than 5% that cannot be justified by objective gender neutral criteria, companies will be required to take action in the form of a joint pay assessment carried out in cooperation with workers' representatives. Access to justice, so under the new directive, workers who have suffered gender pay discrimination can receive compensation, including full recovery of back pay and related bonuses or payments in kind. And while the burden of and pay discrimination cases has traditionally fallen on the employee, it will now be up to the employer to prove that they've not violated EU rules on equal pay and pay transparency. Penalties for violations may, must be effective, proportionate and will include fines. And finally, broadening the scope. So for the first time, intersectional discrimination, the combination of multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage, such as gender, ethnicity, or sexuality, has been included in the scope of the new rules. So the directive also contains provisions ensuring that the needs of workers with disabilities are taken into account. So given the pay transparency directive and the ongoing focus on equality, we anticipate that pay transparency and equal pay is likely to be a theme for the next few years. And employers should be ensuring any pay gap and equal pay issues in their organizations are addressed now to avoid claims further down the line. I appreciate this a quick canter through the gender pay gap and providing our top tips, but if anyone has any questions or would like to speak to us, then please just let us know or pop them in the chat. I know we have a couple of questions that we can come back to. Um, and if you do have any questions you'd like to get in touch to speak to us, then please feel free to do that. Lee, do you want to go next? And I'll have a look at the questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so as just as already, we can come back to the questions um, at the end and have hopefully have a bit of a, an open discussion about those. Um, but as Laura mentioned, I'm Lee um, and I'm an associate here in the Glasgow team at Burness Paul. Um, Today I'm going to have a quick look through um, some recent case law and some practical tips that we can take from that. Um, to be honest, it's been a bit of a slow couple of months for the case law, but we've filled out a few that we think would be particularly helpful um, and that we can draw some um, tips uh, from. Firstly, uh, there's Bradley against Culture Shift Communications Limited. Um, now, this is a case where the employment tribunal had to determine whether the claimant's long COVID amounted to a disability under the Equality Act. The facts of the case are that the claimant caught COVID in November 2020, and until mid-2021, his symptoms were at their worst and included chronic fatigue, chest pains, anxiety, depression, and general brain fog struggled to work full time and so was signed off um, of work in March 2021 with long COVID. His symptoms improved from then until mid-June 2021, but he was taking antidepressants and still required to nap during the day. During that time, he actually managed to set up a business and he also exercised, but his fitness levels weren't what they were pre-COVID. Um, he could only run 5k in 26 minutes instead of 20 minutes and he only attended the gym three times per week compared to his pre-COVID regime of attending the gym six times per week. Uh, these stats were confirmed by his Strava account um, and also by medical information as well. He then raised an employment tribunal claim for disability discrimination um, and the employment tribunal had to determine if the claimant was disabled within the meaning of the Equality Act. Of course, to succeed in his claims, the claimant's condition had to meet the definition of disability um, under the Equality Act, which is an impairment that has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on the claimant's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. The effect of an impairment is long-term, if it lasts, um, generally speaking, for more than 12 months, is likely to last for at least 12 months or is likely to last for the rest of the person, the life of the person affected. An interesting point um, of contention in this case was the fact that the claimant was still exercising regularly and had actually managed to set up his own business during the relevant period, which was between April and July 2021. But the Employment Tribunal noted that when they were determining whether an individual is disabled, the focus should actually be on what the claimant can't do, um, which was particularly relevant in this case. The tribunal accepted the claimant's evidence that he was suffering from reduced athletic performance and that the therapy he was undergoing encouraged him to be active as part of his recovery routine, which was confirmed by his GP records, which were submitted to the Employment Tribunal. 
the employment tribunal accepted the claimant's evidence that he was able to set up and run a business because he could take breaks and sleep during the day when he was needed to. The employment tribunal concluded that taking the claimant's medical condition as a whole and their effect on normal day-to-day -day activities, which includes the ability to effectively carry out full-time working and managing a business, it is apparent the claimant was substantially affected, not least by fatigue and lethargy. I'm oh, sorry, Kelly. Um, yeah, that's uh, Bradley against Culture Shift Communications Limited, the case that we're speaking about just now. So while we've already had a couple of cases now at this point concerning whether long COVID can amount to a disability, um, I think it was covered in our October Employment Law Lab. And if you follow our blogs on the website, my colleague Gavin also um, did a blog on the first case of this nature. Um, this one serves as a bit of a useful reminder that the focus should be on what an individual can't do when we're assessing whether there's an impact on their day-to-day uh, -day activities. Each case will obviously um, turn on its own fact. Um, especially so given long COVID symptoms and their severity seem to vary very greatly from person to person. But employers should keep in mind that an individual undertaking social activities and physical exercise regularly may still be disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act. And actually in some of those activities might be recommended by medical professionals to assist in their recovery. It's key that when managing anyone with a potential disability, an employer considers the correct legal test to determine whether an individual is disabled and applies that to the individual's own personal circumstances, because as we say, it will very much turn on the facts of each case. To assist in that assessment, it's important that both you as employers and um, medical are asking the medical advisors the, the questions which reflect, reflect the legal definition in the, of disability under the Equality Act. So that there is a physical or mental impairment, that it has a substantial adverse effect on someone's ability to carry out their day-to-day -day activities and that it's long-term. So moving on to the next case then, we have um, Cope against Razzle Dazzle Costumes Limited, a great name, um, where it was the duty of the tribunal to consider whether an employee who said, I'm done and handed in their keys had resigned. So a classic uh, case of whether someone has resigned. In this case, the claimant was a factory supervisor. And during the summer of 2021, a colleague of the claimants had resigned, saying that the claimant was a bully. The colleague was later given permission to retract their resignation, which might be relevant here. Um, the claimant was quite upset by the accusations and stated that if she had to work with that colleague, she would go off sick. So something which we might be familiar with. Um, after discussion, the claimant agreed to remain committed to getting through the conflict and a further meeting followed and the claimant threatened to resign again if the conflict was not sorted. The claimant was anxious about the allegations made against her and so the company reassured her that they would resolve the matters um, through the internal processes. The following day from that meeting, the claimant tried to contact one of the owners of the business uh, who she had a good relationship with, but she couldn't get through to her on the phone. So she then went into the office and was visibly quite upset. Um, when she realised that the owner was not in the office to speak to, she just placed her keys on the desk and said to another colleague, I'm done, with a hand gesture to indicate that she was finished. She hugged her colleague and then left. It later transpired that the claimant's stoma bag had leaked, which had intensified her anxiety that day. The claimant drove past the owner she'd been looking for as she left the site. The colleague then told the owners that the claimant had resigned. And that night, the claimant texted the owner to say, sorry to bother you at home. I couldn't wait earlier to speak to you. I tried, but I couldn't stay there any longer. My nerves are shot. Never in my whole life have I ever been made to feel like this. So you might think quite clear. <laughs> And what her intentions were. However, the respondent didn't clarify with the claimant if she had resigned, um, but the claimant didn't attend work the next day as she was on holiday, but then contacted the respondent to confirm that she was going to submit a fit note. Um, she requested a meeting with the respondent on 21st of September, where she apologised for leaving work and requested to return to work. She submitted a fit note, which covered the 10th of September to the 24th of September for stress and anxiety, but 
the respondent said that they had treated the claimant's employment as terminated when she had put down her keys and said that she was done. The claimant raised, among some other claims, a claim of unfair dismissal and also wrongful dismissal. In this case, the tribunal held that no reasonable employer could have considered that the claimant's actions were an act of unambiguous resignation. So they didn't agree that, she, that her actions had amounted to an unambiguous uh, resignation here. The claimant didn't state that she was resigning ever. Um, and the submission of a sick note was inconsistent with her intention to resign. So the tribunal instead found the respondents took the opportunity to dispense of the claimant to avoid managing the conflict between her and her colleague and that the claimant was therefore unfairly dismissed. I think you might all agree that this situation is not necessarily unusual um, and that there could be some doubt sometimes when we have employees um, submitting resignation. So if there ever is any doubt as to whether an employee has intended to resign, we'd recommend that an employer seek um, their explicit confirmation. To help with that, even if the resignation was clear, if it was said in the heat of the moment, the employee should be allowed some time to change their mind. And further, where a, re a resignation might be made orally, as was the case in this claim, um, the contract of employment should also be checked to assess whether a resignation requires to be given in a particular form and served in a particular manner, for example, in writing or by post, just to make sure that um, the resignation is valid as well. And then on to the next case then. We have uh, Randall against Trent College Limited. Um, and this is a case where the tribunal had to determine if a school chaplain had been discriminated against on the grounds of religion or belief after being subject to disciplinary action for giving a sermon during which he expressed anti-LGBT plus views to school pupils. So the facts of the case were that the claimant uh, was a school chaplain in an Anglican Foundation co-ed school. And in 2019, the school had introduced an Educate and Celebrate program, which is a recognised best practice program for schools with the aim of taking a whole school approach to tackling homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying and ingrained attitude in schools. The claimant attended a training day on that program, so he was well aware of it. Some time later, uh, the claimant delivered a sermon to children who were aged between 11 and 13, the content of which resulted in immediate complaints from pupils. The claimant did caveat his sermon with a need for respect and a sort of love thy neighbour approach, but the pupils complained that they'd heard the fundamental message that, in essence, it was wrong to be LGBT plus and religious belief allowed him to discriminate against those or allowed others to discriminate. Feedback was then provided to the claimant based on the complaints that had been received, but nonetheless, uh, he delivered the same sermon the next day unchanged to even more pupils. Um, and then which followed an unprecedented number of complaints from both pupils and also staff. So following a disciplinary process, the claimant was perhaps unsurprisingly dismissed for gross misconduct. Um, on appeal, he was reinstated subject to his agreement to adhere to 20 management instructions designed to prevent the repeat behaviour. The school also made referrals to a local authority designated officer for safeguarding and to the government prevent programme, which is aimed at preventing radicalisation of children regarding the contents of the sermons and also based on uh, the claimant's lack of remorse in response to the complaints and the potential harm caused to the pupils. Those referrals were made on the guidance of the relevant authorities that it would be safest to make a referral for, for consideration. Subsequently, following COVID, again, <laughs> cropped up a lot during this session, and the need for the school to save costs, he was then made redundant. But the claimant raised several employment tribunal claims, including that he had been discriminated against because of his religious beliefs due to the disciplinary proceedings and the referrals that were made to the local authority and the government prevent program. He also claimed his redundancy dismissal was unfair, but that's a bit of a side point. So the employment tribunal held that the school's treatment of the claimant was not discriminatory. The reason that the school took the relevant actions was not because of the claimant's beliefs, but because of the objectionable manifestation of those beliefs 
the employer had no objection to the claimant's beliefs or how he chose to manifest them. It was because of where and to whom he expressed his beliefs and the way he expressed them, which was objectionable and caused the employer to act to safeguard its pupils from harm or potential harm. The particular sermon was delivered to children with no opportunity for debate and the tribunal could not accept that the claimant's right to manifest his beliefs in the manner he did could ever outweigh the school's duty to safeguard its pupils from harm or potential harm. And further, the tribunal held that when the claimant was dismissed for a second time, there was a genuine redundancy situation. So I think it's clear that this is another sort of tricky case on managing conflicting beliefs. Discrimination is unlikely to be found to have occurred if an employer can demonstrate a clear justification for taking action against the worker, which is properly separable from the protected belief or its legitimate expression. Clear policies and staff training on what is and what is not acceptable are crucial to ensure that all staff understand what is expected of them. And before taking action, an employer should consider whether a less intrusive measure could be used to address matters. In this case, of course, the employer or had already tried to educate the claimant about what was appropriate behaviour following a similar sermon in, um, he had given in 2016, and they had also given him the training on this as well. In determining whether the respondent's actions were justified, the tribunal considered that the respondent had already tried a less intrusive approach by trying to educate the claimant, and this assisted in their defence in this case. Managing competing beliefs in similar scenarios is becoming more and more common for employers at the moment, um, and we'll actually be running a transgender awareness training, which includes a, a look at managing competing protected characteristics in the workplace. Um, you can get details of the training in the written law lab when it's sent out, um, if anyone is interested as well. So having gone through the various cases and um, just a few key legislative legislative changes to uh, bring to your attention. So first of all we've got the Employment Allocation of Tips Act um, so on the 2nd of May uh, the Employment Allocation of Tips Bill received royal assent which means upon entry into force um, there will be significant changes to employers obligations across sectors like hospitality and leisure that have common tipping practices. This bill places new obligations on employers to distribute tips fully, fairly and transparently. And the government claims that this will mean around 200 million pounds more makes its way each year to the roughly two and a half million employees who work in those industries. This bill amends the Employment Rights Act to create a legal obligation on employers to give in full all tips, gratuities and service charges earned to their employees withholding tips will be illegal um, and qualifying tips will include, bo include both those received by workers and employers. The distribution can't be subject to any deductions beyond those required by law for tax purposes and it must happen at the end of the month following receipt of the tip from the customer. The money must also be given to those workers within the establishment in which it was earned and discrimination against agency workers is explicitly prohibited with their inclusion and equal treatment mandated as well in the bill. The obligations are uh, to be fulfilled by employers whose employees receive tips on more than an occasional basis through the implementation of a clear and fair written policy. So while the terms of the policy are up to the employer, it must be compatible with the statutory code of practice on tipping and the principles of fairness and transparency which are contained within them. That code will be admissible in, um, as evidence in employment tribunals and it will ultimately be the standard that employers seeking to avoid claims will have to adhere to. Along with uh, a written and compliant policy, employers will also be obliged to maintain a record of how tips were distributed for three years following their receipt. So this, along with the policy itself, can be requested and scrutinised by relevant employees at any time. Notably, employees will also have a 12-month window rather than the usual three to bring claims of alleged non-compliance by their employer um, with the obligations under the Act. Um, so this heightens the likelihood of claims arising under this legislation. The Act isn't in force yet. Um, it's anticipated that it will come into force at some point in 2024 with the exact date to be announced later this year. 
it's likely that there'll probably uh, be a further consultation and secondary legislation. But in the meantime, um, if you want to future proof, then please do get in touch about uh, compliant tipping policies. And last but not least, um, some EU related employment changes. We thought we were done with that with Brexit, but we're not. So on the 10th of May, uh, the Department for Business and Trade published smarter regulations regulation to grow the economy, which is a high level policy paper um, and the first in what's intended to be a series of regulatory reform announcements. The paper sets out the government's desire to use the UK's regulatory decoupling from the EU to bring forth some new proposals that if, if implemented are intended to drive economic growth. Regardless of their economic impact, the measures highlighted would mean significant changes to UK employment law. It's notable that on the same day as releasing the policy paper, the UK government also announced that they were ditching their plans to have a sunset clause on retained EU laws. So prior to the reversal, unless a piece of EU legislation had been specifically retained through the UK's parliamentary process, it would automatically disappear from our legislative framework in December this year. With many of the UK's employment laws stemming from EU directives, that would have resulted in a further raft of very significant changes to the UK's employment law. So instead, the government has stated that all laws now will be automatically retained unless the government decides to disapply them. So far, none of the pieces of legislation on the list um, for repeal will create any material changes to the current employment law landscape uh, for UK-based employers, but there are a few proposals to be mindful of. So the proposals include uh, the amalgamation of the separate legal concepts of what we've come to describe as Euroleave, so the four weeks holiday under the EU Working Time Directive, and additional UK leave, which is the extra 1.6 weeks um, of leave afforded under the Working Time Regulations. The overall statutory leave entitlement will remain the same, but the government is inviting views from employers and workers on the best method of the calculation of holiday pay. So here we are again. <laughs> Those of you who have grappled with that um, issue over the years, including the question of what variable pay could, should be included for holiday pay purposes, will know that the calculation of holiday pay is no not very simple, <laughs> to put it frankly. Um, the government's stated aim here is to reduce the administrative hassle for employers um, while also ensuring that workers' rights are not eroded. Um, but against that backdrop, it's difficult to see how the government could justify restricting holiday pay back to basic pay only again, but we'll need to keep our ears peeled on that after the consultation has concluded. There's also a suggestion of the removal of the requirement for employers to keep written records of daily working time for the purposes of demonstrating compliance with the working time regulations. A proposal to allow the currently unlawful approach of rolled up holiday pay, which would effectively allow employers to pay in lieu of accrued holidays where workers work irregular hours. It also noted that the government is currently consulting on the calculation of annual leave entitlement for part year workers, as well as those with irregular hours. So they'll probably look at that um, alongside those changes as well. There's also a proposal for the simplification of the Chippy regulations, but not as much as you might <laughs> wish for, um, with the extension of the current micro business exemption going um, from employee representative consultation obligations. So currently businesses uh, can't consult employees directly where do they, they do not have employee representatives in place. Instead, there's a requirement to elect new employee representatives. So while the micro business exemption from this currently only applies to businesses with fewer than 10 employees, this will be widened to include businesses with fewer than 50 employees. And coupled with that extension, it's also proposed that uh, any size of organization will be able to consult directly with employees as long as they don't have existing employee representatives in place and fewer than 10 employees are affected by the Chupi transfer.
there's one measure which stands out from a business protection perspective, and that's a proposal to introduce legislation capping the duration of non-compete restrictive covenants at three months post-termination of employment. So, of course, currently post-termination non-compete clauses in employment contracts um, are one of the most restrictive forms of business protection devices that employers can utilise. Those provisions are to prevent an employee following the conclusion of their employment from creating, having a material interest in, and or being an employee or other stakeholder of a business which competes with their former employer. So that means that often employees are prevented from taking uh, jobs with competitors in specific sectors for periods of up to around 12 months is usually what we see um, for most senior executives. Um, the government has identified that the use of lengthy non-competes as a considerable impediment to and disincentive to worker mobility and talent acquisition. So this policy paper outlines a new restriction on post-termination non-compete provisions, which would cap the length of such restrictions to a maximum of three months after termination of employment, which is a significant shortening on the periods that are often used in contracts at the moment. Um, the government is clear that this change will not interfere with other restrictive covenants in employment contracts, so that's not going to extend to the ability of employers to utilise notice periods, garden leave, non-solicitation clauses or confidentiality provisions. Um, and it strongly suggests that it will be focused on the employment context, so not likely to be extended to the use of similar clauses in transactional documentation, for example. This approach is in line with the approach taken in other jurisdictions, uh, such as Germany, Italy and the US. Um, and ultimately, the policy paper marks the government's future direction um, and remains subject to case law. The government haven't committed yet to a timescale for the reforms and other competing political priorities are likely to consume the government's time before that is implemented. However, it's prudent at this stage to start thinking about your current suite of restrictive covenants for key employees and whether going forward you might wish to rely more heavily on other restrictions which are unaffected by these proposals such as garden leave and um, non-dealing or non-solicitation -solicita clauses which will become of critical importance if these changes are implemented. And with that we can turn our focus to the questions coming up in the chat box. So um, Fiona Harrison, is that what was the name of that regulation? Is the regulation about the uh, employment allocation of tips or the proposed changes from the government? I think it was at the proposed changes from the government at that time. Lee. Yeah, so that's just come in from the it's just proposals which have been presented through the Smarter Regulation to Grow the Economy paper. Yeah, so the micro businesses from Tupi is, is the proposal which has stemmed from that. So it's not currently um, going through uh, Parliament, but there's no time frame for that at the moment. Perfect. John, just to touch on yours, I know I'm skipping a few, across a few questions about the PowerPoint slides. We'll definitely take that on board. Thanks for raising it. A copy of the recording that's been taken today will be sent in the next couple of days to everyone who's attended. So you'll get a copy of the recording as well. And I believe there's also a bulletin which is sent out, which includes a lot of the information that we talk about um, to all attendees as well. So you'll receive that, but we'll take on board the feedback. It's greatly received. Just going back to the first question, so Angela, you'd said, do you think that gender pay gap is now somewhat on the back burner with employers due to all the other economic challenges at the moment? Totally appreciate there are so many economic challenges that many of our clients are facing, employers specifically at the moment, it's very difficult. In terms of gender pay gap, because of the mandatory reporting for some employers, that's still an aspect that they need to be mindful of and they do have to report that. For employers who don't have to report, it may be that it is falling a little bit behind because there are other challenges that we're dealing with, but it is still something that employers should consider, especially given the new EU paid transparency directive that's coming in to force um, within the next few years within the EU. For anyone who's cross border, it may apply and it may start to impact on what employees in the UK are, are expecting. So yes, it may 
be that for some employers it's on the back burner but for many who still have to mandatory report it's still a consideration that needs to be made and then Claire do you know if there are any plans for how gender pay gap and gender bonus gap are calculated as some of it doesn't make sense e.g company car versus car allowance bonus not provided for part-time at the minute I don't actually believe there are any plans to reform this there was recent guidance published in the middle of March this year in terms of how the calculation should be broken down that, that might be helpful if you've not seen that but at the moment there are, I don't believe there are any plans for how gender pay gap and gender bonus gap are calculated there we're anticipating to come out but that's not to say that there couldn't be a surprise piece of guidance given. Generally what we see on that is um, employers using the ability to uh, explain any any differences in or, or a significant pay gap by explaining a bit more the detail about why their calculations have turned out a particular result so it might be something that you could address through that avenue as well. I think that's all the questions addressed does anyone have any other questions or comments or has anyone the case name of I'm done. It was the, um, let me just get it up here, short term memory loss. Um, it was the very jazzy name of Cope v Razzle Dazzle Costumes Limited. And again, that'll be um, contained in the bulletin that goes out after the training as well for reference. Any other questions or has anyone got any comments on things they've done to lower their gender pay gap that they found worked well or any other tips they might want to add to our list of tips or any discussion around the cases? Nope. Silence is golden. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for your time this morning. Then we'll give you some uh, time back. And again, if there's any questions or comments that you have, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us or with your usual Burnus Paul contact as well. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.